over time we will be transitioning and unbundling out of ESCOM, so it's appropriate that I first recognize the role that ESCOM has actually done in, in enabling today to be a success. It is the first of the group's re, um, unbundling process, which has commenced several decades ago, so it's great to mark this day. In terms of today's importance, and hence we felt it was important to just pause and reflect firstly on the journey we've been on and recognizing the complexities of unbundling a business of this nature. And at the same time, this was done during low shedding as well as at a time when the company needed to reinvest in transmission infrastructure. So that is really one part. The second element which is more critical is to say the energy and electricity reform is so critical to ensure that South Africa is competitive. That competitiveness comes in two forms. The first element of that is ensuring that we can shift our investments from historically where we were invested in transmission infrastructure to support power generation, which are predominantly coal dominated, to where we have endowments with respect to electricity and renewables, particularly in the coastal regions. So that's the first element of that. We've just seen when Minister was presenting today, the cost reductions and levelized cost reductions that have come out of renewables today and with the abundance of sun and, and wind that we have we have an opportunity to bring on board as many as possible of those renewables. The second element of that is that as we transition through to the just energy transition these investments are going to create a crucial element in terms of not only getting access to the renewables but as part of the broader South African power pool we also have opportunities including South Africa of hydro sources and other lower um, carbon sources of power generation. We need to also support that as we shift into the future. As a result, everything we're doing should benefit the customer. We have to see the price competitiveness coming back and coming down significantly and this is the role of NTCSA. Uh, the fact that we are still within the group does not necessarily remove that opportunity and we are operating independently and will make well-informed decisions to ensure that we can accelerate the ability for South Africa to connect as many um, generators as possible. So leading the board at this time, what would you say are the short-term strategic priorities? I think first of all, this has been a major transformation for the organization. So it's quite important that we remember that our people are the heart of everything we do. So we continue our focus on ensuring that we're retaining our people, but at the same time looking for talent to complement our existing capacity. The second element of that is continuing to focus on the lights on. We have to ensure that we're providing safe and reliable energy as we move forward, particularly safety at the heart of that as well. And then thirdly, we are catching up. We've spoken a lot about grid development today. The significant investments require us to unlock the 53 gigawatts in this uh, next 10 years is quite significant. And we have to make sure that we are capacitated, we're working with partners to be able to deliver. Um, the Ministry has been really helpful in ensuring that some of the barriers such as servitudes, land access are being addressed swiftly in an optimized manner. At the same time we're starting to see huge challenges with regard to global supply chain because the grid capacity constraints are not a South African phenomenon, they're actually global as the world decarbonizes. So we're also making sure that as we shift we have proper strategic partners with OEM to ensure that South Africa can also be able to revitalize its economy and that we can deliver on a mandate. I would say those are probably the, third, the, the three key elements, but at the same time we do recognize that our transition is five years. So we have to make sure that we are actually capable to transition. We can set up the um, CPA, um, which is a central purchasing agency as an investor in the act, and at the same time ensure that we are able to provide trading as we move forward. So we've issued um, the market code for comments and we welcome everyone to participate in terms of that. But also in the short term there will be an application before the regulator for the revenue that you need for the coming three years. How important is it for you that NTCSA receives a ring fence determination? 
I mean, it is the critical part of our ability to deliver the ambition in terms of the investments going forward. And for us, what is quite important as we move forward is that this is not only for NTC, it's for the country. We've seen a lot of investments in the past focused on generation capacity, which will still be required. Um, at the same time, we have to unlock the potential. So to do that, we need cost-reflective tariffs. Um, one of the key boundaries that we've set for ourselves as we move forward is that we want to create a sustainable business and not necessarily go back for government support. So tariffs are going to be quite critical. But they also encourage and ensure that we're efficient. We have to leverage digital to ensure that whatever we're applying for, our costs going forward are competitive. But at the same time, we have to give investors the people who are going to provide the debt going forward, that there's certainty in the regulatory reform. As mentioned earlier on, I'm encouraged with the dialogues that we're having with the regulator, that all of these principles are well understood and that we'll have a robust dialogue as we move forward. And with tariffs and with uh, the historic debt, will you have enough to pursue your investment ambitions over the next five years of 112 billion to connect up to 30 gigawatts or do you need help? Um, we have set up a clear capital structure for NTCSA based on global practices. We also understand that a, we are not necessarily a significant contributor to the debt. So when you release the financials, you'll see that although there's some debt that we are carrying, it is reasonable from a capital structure perspective. And with the ESCOM holdings, there's been an alignment as well that allocations of the treasury from a debt relief will also be proportionally allocated to the respective entity. So that's not probably our biggest concern at this particular stage. Our biggest focus is how do we make sure that we have the right tariffs that will actually complement the investments required. And this is where we're looking at. And we've run scenarios, um, and I'm not going to disclose that, as you'll expect as a diligent, robust boss, but to make sure that we can actually assess the sweet spot of what type of tariffs will ensure that we are sustainable and we do believe that those outcomes all of them still ensures that at minimum the 112 billion that we are committing to can be serviced and we can meet that as we move forward. And speaking of a sweet spot is the 112 billion all of your account or are you looking to private sector participation? This is what we've modeled on our balance sheet for the next five years um, as we mentioned we would like to accelerate the biggest opportunity that will come is to increase that 112 from the private sector funding. Again, tariff structure and reform is going to be important to enable that. Hence, today we also emphasize then the importance of not encumbering our balance sheet because we can't provide um, access, private sector at the same time use the same balance sheet that we are using to, um, to support the 112 billion that we are investing in. To leverage private sector participation, we need a framework, we need a model that we're going to pursue. What do you see as that sweet spot model? So what we are hoping for, and my t the, the, the a team and, and, and the ESCOM holdings are engaging with the ministry, as well as the World Bank, it's good to see them attending today. We believe that the biggest part of it is to make sure that the risk sharing mechanism is balanced. The learnings from the IPPs is that we accelerated significant and unlock investments, but the state is carrying huge um, securities and guarantees at the back of that. So that's a big learning. So if we can address that particular point, we can actually accelerate access to the private sector. So that's one element of it. And of course, we have to develop the regulations. The ministry is quite progressing on that and we are participating and we encourage that it will be issued. Mr. Skip has mentioned uh, first quarter next year for the regulations and then the determination to go out. If we can resolve the tariff, resolve how we then deal with the issues pertaining to risk sharing between public sector and private sector, I think that would be the, risk, the, the sweet spot. But we can have all risks sitting with the public sector, the benefits in the private sector. But that uh, framework, that risk sharing framework, would you accept a build, operate and transfer model or are you only limiting yourself to a build and transfer model? We are extending ourselves to the build and operate uh, and build, operate and transfer, all ITP models, we, have, we are not selective, subject to Swiss sport on risk sharing. We do not have a balance sheet to guarantee the build, operate and transfer. And what time frame are you giving yourselves, uh, both you and the, the principal government, in making this determination of that sweet spot, that new framework for RPTs? A lot of work has been done as articulated by the minister 
key is to get the regulations in terms of Section 34B out, then the determination will follow from that. In the next couple of months, I have no doubt that the Ministry will be sharing clear timelines in terms of that. But in the meantime, I would like to invite this private sector that we should not dialogue this in the public spaces. We are open for dialogues, for discussions, and let's shape this upfront proactively together because that will also minimize the amount of dialogues that happen once the documents are out for um, open reviews and discussions as well. And with the updated TDP just on the horizon, will there be specific projects set aside for private sector participation, specific corridors or will that come later? We have already identified a project um, that we believe that it will actually provide a number of learnings for all of us. So um, we will continuously work with that. The timing of when that project, whether it will be still be suitable or not, is something we're discussing internally. But as we move forward, the team has got a number of projects, predominantly in the coastal areas, that we are quite excited to put forward for ITP testing. Um, and as part of that, as you know, it's going to be um, who's a counterparty to the revenue side and the offtake and dealing with all of those issues. And I think that will give us some good learnings between us and the private sector. And are you not able to identify where that project will be? Um, all I can say is that it's going to be in one of the three capes <laughs> at this stage. That's, uh, yeah. And finally, this business is now, once the Electricity Regulation Act is fully in force, which it isn't yet, but the signals that it will come into force in some form, you've got a five-year period or so to transition to a fully independent business and the transmission system operator role. You know, how, can, how will we see that evolve and how important is that to the future of the electricity supply industry and to the just energy transition? Yes, I think I mentioned that in the beginning when I said one of our biggest benefits is to attract as many generators as possible into the transmission grid, but at the same time connect to the endowments and resources in the region as well. And that will drive cost of generation even further down. So what we are preparing ourselves for is that over the last couple of years, actually since our existence, we have actually excelled in our operations as a transmitter and as well as a system operator. We are now getting into uncharted territories. We have to become a trading hub uh, and create a trading platform and part of that is also now taking accountability for all the IPPs and being able to, to manage that as we move forward. That brings different risk profiles, different capabilities, systems and tools that we don't have. So one of the things that we are starting to work on now and we are quite advanced is defining an operating model of what our future business and its segments will look like. We've approved that as a board and we're now busy resourcing that. The key element of that as well is working with NASA and the uh, relevant ministries to make sure that the risks that are envisaged in terms of pricing challenges, liquidity risk, are also addressed as we move forward. And lastly, I've mentioned the issue of the grid code, uh, sort of the market code. I'm really encouraging everyone to participate in terms of that because it's going to be the key enabler to ensure that we have an efficient power sector going forward. And finally, finally, what's in it for the consumer? At the end of the day, our aspirations is to make sure that over time you should see your cost of electricity going down and that should encourage investments into the private sector, into the, uh, into the country by the private sector. But at the same time, we need to make sure that households can afford their power uh, energy and we can roll out more and more power. I was giving example the other day that I was in Boloko and I still saw women pushing wheelbarrow um, with wood. We need to address the issue of energy poverty and electricity poverty is real, mostly in the rural areas. Even where they are connected, they can't afford it. So we have to make sure that they can have access to, to, to electricity. And then the other part that we are also hoping for as we move forward is to make sure that the country can decarbonize and we can actually ensure that our commodities are competitive globally and we afford measures such as avoid measures such as the cross-border adjustment mechanisms as we move forward so that we are one of the global um, partners trade partner that we drive our economy in terms of that I was going to say lastly again and I need to say that as I mentioned during our speech as a board we were not really only looking at how much gigawatts we're providing, the networks that we understand and that we will drive costs down. But we are really concerned about the unemployment rate in the country. And as we do this, 
we are going to push ourselves together with our partners as well as government to make sure that we can utilize this infrastructure to re uh, vitalize some of the industries such as steel, but also to employ as many of the youth that are unemployed during this process. So all of this are being run concurrently and that's what we've been working on over the last couple of months.